Yeah. What's up, everybody? You guys ready to go on a little journey? Yeah. Let's go on a journey. Um, yesterday, so uh, being, a, being a dad, I mean, it's Father's Day, so I just have to mention one thing. Um, being a dad is very, very difficult. Um, being a parent or somebody who influences a young child, it's very difficult. Um, but I like to run with my kiddos, and that's often how I'll get my sermon prep time in. You've heard me say that, like I'll go for a run. So if you ever see me running, if I'm that week, if I'm preaching, I'm, I'm prepping for the sermon, trying to orient my heart to what I'm going to be talking about, sharing about. And um, yesterday, I was going, we were going around the Capitol, and if you've ever been to the Capitol, there's some trail bushes on the, side of, on the north side of the Capitol that you can run through that are kind of like secluded, and it's kind of like, you, you don't actually think you're in the city. And when you're pushing two children that weigh about 100 pounds together, you know, th- through that, it's really hard. Um, so I was running up the back side, or on the north side of the, the trail, and I just wanted to stay on the path. And I'm staying on the path, and Cohen's like, let's go through the trail. And I'm like, Cohen, it is too hard for Daddy to push you through the trail. And Cohen said this, Daddy, in this household, we do hard things. <laughs> And I was like, ah, you're right. I did say that to you earlier today and yesterday. So I'm like, gosh, I guess I have to. So I turned back and we went through it and I got like all these stickers on my socks and like there's actually a bunch of bugs that whipped off of the, the weeds because they're so high and it's really hard to push through. And he's like, there, Daddy, there's spiders on me now. I'm like, I told you, you know, but we learned together. But I just thought it was funny because it's like, man, these little, these little human beings, they, they do listen to us. And it does connect today to, um, um, to what I'm going to be sharing. I'm going to be speaking a little bit in the book of Proverbs. And I'll just say this up front. My, my, my hope is that you would leave today being persuaded, whether you're older or younger, The book of Proverbs is to persuade. And I'm going to just throw the invitation out right here, the challenge. I want you to read the whole book of Proverbs um, in this month, in this series. Uh, This is a picture of, bring it up. Can you guys see that? That is my, this is Opal, my great-grandmother. And she died when she was 92. I was a freshman in high school. And um, yeah, anywho... This is my great grandma. Well, let's leave it up there. She was she was wonderful. Uh, just a couple things about my great grandma Opal. Uh, we we gave her name to Adeline's middle name, so it's Adeline Opal. But this woman played a huge role in my life spiritually. She didn't have much money, but throughout the year, the little money she had as a widow, she would save about a hundred bucks. And she would send me to camp every summer. It was called Woodbine Ranch. And it was at Woodbine Ranch where I felt God's just knowing that God loved me. And I responded to God's love to where I'm like, okay, I'm going to follow you. And it was actually at this little, there was a concert. This guy named Danny Ortley just, you know, did an invitation. Do you want to follow Jesus? And I did. But it was because my great-grandma Opal saved the little bit of money. And she, um, she sent me to camp. And, um, yeah. About a month ago, I was in my room, and on Chantel and I's room wall, we have this plaque. And uh, it says Chantel and Jim, but then says this, this, this proverb. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will lead your path straight. And this is on our wall, and it says, you know, we got this when we were married, so September 22nd. 2012. We got married here in Bismarck. And I love this on my wall because if I ever forget my, my anniversary date, <laughs> I just go right to the wall. It's right there, right? So that's what this has been used for. Sorry, Chantal. I'm just messing. I know our, our, our anniversary date. Um, but this, um, I, I, uh, it was about a month ago where I, I saw it on the wall, and it's so familiar to me because it's always been there. This verse, I know this verse by heart, but I just remember just stopping and like looking at it and being like, what does this mean? I just remember I took about 30 seconds just like, what does this even mean? This has been on my wall. What does it mean to trust in the Lord with all your heart? What does it mean to not lean on your understanding? What does it mean to acknowledge him 
and he will make your path straight. And in that time of quick contemplation, really, the first person I thought of was my grandma Opal, great-grandma Opal. And um, because it was her favorite verse. I just knew it. You know, you might know somebody that this was their favorite verse. And um, it made me think of my grandma Opal. And uh, a couple, couple weeks ago, my mom came up, uh, and I don't know why she did this, but she, Grandma Opal, in, when she was getting toward the end of her, her life, my mom had her write in a, in a book just memories and thoughts of who, like, what life was like. And my mom brought it up, and she didn't know I had this, like I was thinking of Grandma Opal with Proverbs um, verse, she brought this up and she actually gave it to Chantel. She didn't give it to me. She said, Chantel, I want you to read this because I want you to know a little bit behind the name um, that Adeline has for her middle name, Opal, like who this woman was. And I'm like, you know, I thought I knew a lot about my grandma. And um, as, as I, I knew I was going to be preaching a sermon, and I'll just throw this out there. The reason I felt compelled to ask Jared to preach these three weeks um, was because I had a conversation with Charlene, and I just felt like over these next three weeks, I'm going to invite you into this journey of, of um, I, I would call it wholehearted faithfulness, if there was a serious theme or whatnot. And, but I had a conversation with Charlene and Chantel, and I was just like, God, what does it look like um, to be faithful? Anywho, my, my mom brought this book up, and I've been reading through it to kind of like study up on my grandma, and I thought I knew a lot about my grandma. Uh, this, this person, um, she just played a huge role. We'd go to her house every Tuesday night when I was little, and my mom would help like, her take a bath, and then we'd have a big family Southern-style meal just for us and our family. Um, so I, I, she, we would always drive into Denver to her, her, um, her church. It was called Bethel Baptist Church, and... Um, in, in its heyday, it was a church of a lot of people. It was this huge congregation that was filled. And something happened um, where it dwindled down to about 20-ish people. And the, the church was kind of split in fours, and they actually had to rope off like one corner, a fourth of the church, and that's where people sat on a Sunday morning. But my, my grandma, she came every Sunday faithfully, and we would, we would join her until she passed, and then we found a church that was closer to our home. Um, anywho, so she just, she, uh, she played a huge role in my upbringing, in my life, and just some things as I was reading this, I actually, I never knew that when my grandmother was 14, her dad left the picture. And so from 14 until she got married, she had to help raise funds and support her mother, who didn't have anyone um, for support. Um, as, I, as I was reading through um, this, like even when she got married, it was really hard for her to leave her mom who really needed her help. Um, as I was reading through this, though, there was times where it was like, it's like back in my day, we didn't have TV. We didn't have the radio. We didn't have any, like, any of this stuff to do, but we would just go outside and we'd figure out things to do and play. And... I had, I've had that a couple times where I'm like, man, it just seems like back in the day was way simpler, right? I don't know if you ever get that sense, like, if I was 100 years ago and we didn't have social media or if I didn't have an iPhone in my pocket, um, maybe things would be a little simpler. I don't know. But as I was reading this, this is what really stuck out to me. I, I don't know if you've ever had this. Sorry. We're just talking about simplicity, and this will tie in. Yesterday, when I was prepping for the sermon, I'll go to the Arboretum here in town, and we're running through. And I, we're going down the Arboretum, and the Arboretum's a place where I try to just like, God, this is a really beautiful place with trees. I'm with Cohen and Adeline. Adeline was sleeping, and as we're going down the trail, there, if you go there, there's just this, this really beautiful flower that is blooming. It's, and it, 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 just, it was incredible. And I get to it, and my first thought was not, hey, I should go you know, go down and smell this beautiful flower and enjoy this creation. My first thought was, I should take a picture of this flower. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but, but for me, this is the best way I could explain of how things might be a little different. Like, rather than, rather than enjoying this beautiful flower that's blooming and it smells amazing, my first thought is, I want to take a picture of that so I can show it to Chantel 
so I can show it to people that I saw this really cool flower. And I'm not saying taking pictures is bad or whatnot. I love taking pictures. And, but, but it was just an interesting, like for me, it's like, why would I rather take a picture than to just enjoy this moment with this beautiful flower? You know, I know it sounds weird, but it just seems like, like back then things were simpler. Like they didn't get distracted back then when Grandma Opal was, was a little kid. Things were just simpler. Anywho, so I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey um, today with these verses that were my great-grandma Opal's favorite verses um, in Proverbs. But let me, let me say this. I don't know if you felt the complexity of life or the chaos of life. Um, I think sometimes it comes down to these ideas of, of control. Um, many of you might know that I'm a huge um, Denver Nuggets fan, and yeah, that's right, Dave, um, yeah, I'm a huge, huge Nuggets fan, and I have to share this because, first of all, they won the championship recently, it took them 47 years, yeah, I, Dave, I know you're a huge fan, thank you, um, somebody, somebody's like, who are the Denver Nuggets, um, but they won the championship, it was a really big deal, if, and I've been following them for a long time, but I'm, I'm fascinated by their, one of their main guys who got the MVP. And I just, this sticks out because this is, this is not the norm. All right? This is not the norm. When you win a championship, you go around and say, I'm going to Disney World, I'm the best, I do the circuits. Um, but this is what um, their main guy said. He says, if you want to be, a, and this, this has no Christian, but it just, I think it, if you want to be a success, you need a couple years, Jokic said after Monday's title game. You need to be bad, then you need to be good. Then when you're good, you need to fail. And when you fail, you're going to figure it out. There is a process. There are steps that you need to fill, and there are no shortcuts. It's a journey, and I'm glad that I'm part of that journey. And then he wrote, this is fascinating. Basketball is not the main thing in my life, and probably never will be. Jokic said before the finals, and to be honest, I like it because I have something more at home, something that is more important than basketball. I think that's what I've learned. I already knew that, but this kind of proved that I was correct. And as a Denver Nuggets follower and a fan of Jokic, um, I, I, just, I resonated with that because it's like there are things that are more important than basketball. There are more things... There's something more important, and, and, and this book of Proverbs is going to emphasize whatever that thing is, and you probably already know it. Um, I, I asked Cohen yesterday, hey, I'm preaching tomorrow, and I'm preaching, um, and Cohen, I need your input. Why are things so complicated? And he said, I don't know. I said, what wisdom would you want people to, to know, or what should I tell, tell people about? And Cohen said, Jesus. <laughs> I thought, I thought, are you just saying the answer? Uh, so I'm like, so does Jesus make things more complicated or more simple? And G Cohen thought for a second, and he said, simple. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, I don't know. But I do think there's something in that, that there, even that easy yoke passage that Sierra shared, that there's something about life with Jesus that makes things simpler even amidst a world that might seem chaotic and disordered or complex or out of control. And here's the reality. We want control. We want to be able to take the picture so we can share it with everybody. We want to control stuff. So, but, but here's the reality. We cannot control God or Jesus, but we want to. And there's going to be an invitation in that. And here's the reality, too. This book of Proverbs that was my great-grandma's favorite. I, I, I have to read this too, real quick. I just got to just... There's two things that really suck out to me. And take, take this. This is incredible. Because, you know, I'm talking about... said, did you ever feel that God had a special calling on your life? She wrote, I never felt I was called to foreign mission work, but I know he wanted me to teach and witness for him. I taught from the age of 14 to 75, at which time Gaylord was not well and he asked me to give up my class. I taught in VBS from high school days. 
it was our pastor who had the first VBS. I was a cu- there was a couple with a couple other ladies after school club on when, and we would sing, had a story time and had good group each week. I held others offices in the church at the as a clerk, secretary and treasurer. But look at that, 14 to 75. What's the math on that? That's 61 years of being a teacher, of faithfully doing something. I, I thought that that was fascinating. The other thing that I thought was just incredible is when I was thinking of this, like this idea of faithfulness, it's like, well, what made my grandma care uh, about Jesus to want to give 61 years of her life to teach? But it wasn't just that, it was her whole life. She wrote this. Um, Name the book or author that helped you develop a philosophy of life. And she wrote the Bible, because that's what you do. But she also wrote the book of Proverbs. And she wrote, it should be read every, or it should be read often. She also wrote the epistles, Corinthians, uh, through Revelation is most profitable. So this is pretty much she said, read the whole Bible. Um, but, you know, it's like, but I just thought it was so fascinating that, that this, this book of Proverbs played such a huge role in her life. And then... Like I was thinking about it, man, it played a huge role in my life. And that's what we're going to explore a little bit today. And one more thing I just have to read. Describe, oh, describe your first trip alone. I never ever went out alone any places. I was a, a, away with my family. This was fascinating. They didn't have enough money. They got married after a church service. And then my grandpa went back to work the next day. And she wrote, it, like, it was just like a casual, like, we got married and then work was the next day. Anywho, sorry. Um, she said, I never went alone any places. I was always with my family. Even when Gaylord passed away was the first time I was alone in my life. But my Lord Jesus has been very precious to me. I am never alone for the Holy Spirit dwells within me and will never leave me. That's the promise of God. I read that. And it made me think, as I wanted to preach this morning on wholehearted faithfulness, here is an example in my life of somebody who is wholeheartedly faithful to Jesus. If you read, her, read what she wrote, there are times where things are difficult, but she recognizes that Jesus was the center and is the center. And in the book of Proverbs, this is fascinating. Like I said, I want you to read it all. But this is um, the passage of Scripture. And I, and I, and I, I even this week, as, as I memorized it, I, I kept thinking of Cohen, my son. I kept thinking of Adeline, my daughter, and Caleb. And I want you to be thinking of the people that you are influencing. Because the book of Proverbs is to persuade people that, that the center is Jesus, and that's the best thing ever. Everything else is not the best. But it's specifically, the book of Proverbs, on the very front end, it's a, it's a dad talking to a son, or you could think of a, of a parent talking to a child. And at the very end of Proverbs, there's a mother who's talking to the son, or you could think of a parent who's talking to a child. And their whole idea is to persuade them to be like, hey, you're going to probably go down some other paths, but this is the best path. So, this, this book of Proverbs, it's, it is super fascinating. There's two themes that come up in the book of Proverbs. The first one is the fear of the Lord. And it's really this idea that we revere or we think of God as the one who is the center of all. And we just happen to be in his orbit. But that there, that, that to revere God is to be like, I'm not the center, you are. A lot of time I want to be the center. Please forgive me if I am the center. But Jesus, God, you are the center. So it's this, this theme of f- that, the, that the fear of the Lord comes first. But then in the book of Proverbs, all throughout it, it talks about this idea of wisdom or chokhmah. And chokhmah means um, it's really this idea that reality is reality. That, that, that wisdom is of God. Everything, how the world operates, is a, there's a framework, there's a blueprint, and wisdom, and seeking wisdom, is trying to figure out how that framework or blueprint operates. There aren't multiple frameworks, so we'll go into our world and navigating it, where it's like, well, you can try a little bit of this framework and a little this framework if it feels you good, and you make the decision, you're the center of all. No, the whole book of Proverbs is it's, it's this framework for living, and that framework involves wisdom. And wisdom can be sought, and that seeking, that person of wisdom is God. 
And so there's these two themes that are all throughout the book of Proverbs. And here's the, the verses. And I thought it was fitting today for, for Father's Day. I think one of my children are in here. They might not be here. But it, it goes like this. Proverbs 3, 1. It says, My son, do not forget my teaching. My son, do not forget my teaching. But let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life and peace they will be added to you now as i'm reading this imagine yourself as the child that the father or the parent or the the mother or the parent is speaking to because it's all about persuading you to take on this wisdom lifestyle which is truth which is reality which are the ways of god so my son It's hard to memorize. Oh, it's up on the screen. My son, do not forsake my teaching, but keep my, let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Then what? Bind it around your neck. Bind it around your neck. Write it on the tablet of your heart. Why? So that you will find favor and great success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will lead your path straight. As I was thinking of this, um, this idea in, in, in these Proverbs and, and whatnot, um, I kept thinking, like, um, you know, like, man, there's something fascinating about this. Because if it's about persuading, what, is the, 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 what are the parents, like, persuading somebody to do? They are persuading them to um, live this, this life, right? Like, what, um, what is this wisdom life? What, what does it look like? What does it mean to fear the Lord or have this wisdom. And, and this wisdom isn't just like head knowledge. This wisdom is like rules for living. And here's another fascinating thing about Proverbs. Sometimes people have engaged the book of Proverbs where it says a proverb in the later portions and be like, well, here's where it says you need to do this and this will happen. The book of Proverbs isn't promises. The book of Proverbs is all about probabilities. And it's this probability. If you do this over a long period of time, this will more than likely happen. And sometimes somebody would be like, well, I followed Jesus my whole life, and the great success that this proverb ta- or this talks about didn't happen, and my life is in shambles. Here's the reality. If, if Jesus is the center of your life, and your life feels like in shambles, you got the best thing anyways. But here's the other reality. Sometimes life is complex, and the book of Proverbs doesn't address it, so you have the other wisdom literature, like Ecclesiastes, where it says, it's very cynical, we have the book of Job, where it's like, I did everything that the Proverbs said, and my life still isn't a great success. But in all of the wisdom literature, it's always, fear the Lord, and pursue wisdom, whatever that looks like. My kids are loud. Um, (laughs) Here's the other thing uh, in in, in this where it says, let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. These are attributes of God. And these attributes of God can also, humans can, can experience these, but it comes by walking with Jesus. Not just once, but making Jesus the center of our life. And one of the th- ways that is very fascinating, that just sticks out to me, what does it say? Um, what does it say there? It says, do what? You need to bind it around your neck or write it on the tablet of your heart. What are you, what are you binding? What are you binding around your neck? And that, like, that's a physical thing. Like you can think, oh, I'm binding... Um, I'm binding a little bit of like, if I do this, like I'll get, it's okay, Luca. Um, you know, what are you binding around your neck? And I know for me and how Jesus has been speaking to me, 
in the, in just even in this last year, there's some good things that he's bound around my neck. You know? One of those things that I've bound around my neck is my family. I love my family. But there was a point um, when I went to um, actually a prayer conference in Fort Wayne, Indiana, where it became very clear that yes, my family was important, but I wanted to control the outcome. I wanted things to happen the way I wanted them to happen. We were expecting a baby, and Caleb is now here, and I wanted that to go perfectly. But I recognized, through God's Spirit working in me, that family was an idol for me, where I was actually putting that before Jesus. You know, kind of like, hey, Jesus, if you show up and work in my family's life, great. But if you don't, I got this. I even think of that with parenting. You know, Jesus, if you don't change my child, okay, but I'm going to do something. I'm going to control the situation or I'm going to completely just let it go. But this Proverbs way of living where we fear God is about recognizing that we aren't the center. The starting point is Jesus, and we go along for the ride. And that ride involves this journey, this, um, this journey of, of, of seeking wisdom in the world. But we don't do that journey of seeking wisdom without that starting point, without the fear of the Lord being our starting point. And here's my, my hypothesis. Yes, A hundred years ago, it might have seemed more simple, but I would say hearts a hundred years ago were as easily distracted away from Jesus as they are today. And so we have different distractions, but we have the same Jesus, steadfast love and faithfulness with those attributes, wisdom with that attribute. We have the same Jesus who invites us to journey with him, step by Steph, a lot of times it might be like this. Okay, Jesus, I want to go on a journey with you. And you, you feel like you start the journey and then Jesus just disappears. Like just goes to another land and it's like, okay, I got to figure this out. Once in a while I'll talk with you or whatnot. Or you might, um, you know, and you might think I got to do this on my own. Or you might step out and be like, okay, I got this. Jesus, we're doing this. I'm doing everything. And if you show up, great, let's do this. But here's the reality is walking with Jesus in this wisdom, fearing of God lifestyle we see in the book of Proverbs that shapes people's lives is this idea of like, okay, Jesus, I don't have all the answers, but I know you do. Please bring me with you. What's going to happen tomorrow? I don't know, but I'm going to go to you to trust you. Um, some of you might have heard of this, this lady, um, Mother Teresa, right? Have you guys, anybody ever heard of Everyone's heard of Mother Teresa, right? Like, that's like the ideal... Um, person to, if you want to be like a super Christian, Mother Teresa is one of them, or a Billy Graham, and these are wonderful people to, to look at their lives, and, or Great Grandma Opal, we can look at their lives and be like, oh my goodness, this is the model that I want, want. but um, I, I heard recently that when Mother Teresa was asked, like how she became who she was, this follower of Jesus, she said, I wake up in the morning, I pray, and I ask God, help me see you your image, and the people I interact with today. And then she goes throughout her day, interacting, trying to walk with Jesus in this this way. And then at the end of the day, she prays and says, who did you help me see or not see Jesus in today? And then she said, that's that's it. It's that simple, you know? And um, so as we're leaving today, um, you've probably been wondering what what all these things are. I'm going to leave you... This was, I'm going to leave you with a little piece of yarn when you go out. And if you really want, just throw it away. If, you know, if you don't want to lug it around or whatnot. But I actually want you to figure out a place, maybe it's on your wrist, maybe it's in your car. Um, I don't know. Find somewhere and bind this to it. I don't, I don't know what it is. And be wrestling with that. What am I bound to? Because the reality is we might be bound to some really good things or some really terrible things. 
But these things that we're bound to, they shape us. They shape our hearts. And the reality of the, how the world works and the framework and the fabric that underlines it all is this wisdom of God. And if God is not the center of what we're doing, then we have to say, God, I'm sorry that you weren't the center of, of the stuff of my family. Here, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Help me know that you are the starting point. And, and, and these really good things, they come next, you know? But, but oftentimes, I, I, you know, I just want you to, to, to reflect and take this as a, as a tangible way to reflect um, this week with that. So I'm going to invite um, our, our music team. Are we, you got another song, Shay? Sweet. I'll invite them back up. And um, I'll have these little pieces of strings for you out here. And, and, and what I was even thinking... Um, um, with this is that, that you would get creative, make it meaningful, or, you know, maybe, maybe don't, but really even just going to God in this. And, 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 and as I was praying about it actually this morning, one of the most difficult things, I think, for people who follow Jesus or have yet to follow Jesus is with this concept. I'm going to go before Jesus and talk with him, or I'm just going to go before Jesus, making him the center of my life, and it's almost like, okay, I got to do something in this, in this interaction. One of the most difficult things to do, I think, is to go be with Jesus and not do anything. Because we think, oh, I'm, I'm with Jesus, I got I to gotta memorize something, I got to do something. But part of binding is recognizing that I am just with Jesus, even just like with that flower, and to just enjoy this God who underlies the fabric of everything we do and to enjoy that. There are times where we have to work out of that. You know, we, we do things and then there's stuff that comes out of that. You know, but we got to be with Jesus. And I, I do believe that when we are with Jesus, those things that are bound around our neck that aren't God, they will start to come off and then the things that matter, a relationship with Jesus, will be on our neck. And so we'll start going through this life and there's distractors all around but it will be easier as we do that. And we're going to fail. Even like Jokic said, we fail. Um, we're going to fail, you know. We're going to fail, but we repent and we come back to God and say, this is where I messed up. I need you. And it's this lifelong journey that we get to go on. So I, I invite you over these next three weeks to, to journey with me in this. Take this little piece of string. I'll hand them out back there at home. Or, um, take it home and put, do whatever you need to do with it. Talk with Jesus this week about the things that are, you're binding around your neck. And um, I'll, I'll pray for us, and then I'll hand it over to you guys. God, we love you. We do. We ask that um, today, that as we go home and we navigate um, this journey, we ask that you would help us recognize that you are there with us navigating this journey with us. You're, you didn't leave us. You are with us, stepping with us. We can't do this on our own, though our hearts want to control and do it all on our own. Also, God, we recognize that life seems complex or chaotic. God, even at the beginning of the world, things seem chaotic, but you brought order to creation. God, things might seem chaotic in our hearts, but you bring order to creation the things that you're doing and creating and growing in us. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would be working with, in, and through us, through your spirit, both right now, today, as you speak to us, and as we go into our weeks. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.